This talk is part of a series presented by the Techade AI for Good conference and hackathon. Our goal with this virtual event is to highlight technological innovation driven by artificial intelligence and directed towards beneficial areas such as health, environment, accessibility, and human rights. Importantly, we also aim to raise money for Centraide or the United Way, a nonprofit dedicated to fighting poverty and social exclusion. And this is where you can help. Please consider donating by clicking the link in the description of this video. Any amount will be greatly appreciated. Also, if you're watching this before November 12, 2020, consider registering to our event for a chance to ask questions and interact with our speakers. This event would not have been possible without the help of our sponsors, such as DeepMind, Ubisoft, Ivado, and Dell Technologies. We thank them for their generous support. Please visit our website for a full list of sponsors and partners. Particularly, we'd like to highlight our gold sponsor, CDW. Proactively mitigating risk will never be easy. It's ongoing, it's daunting, it's confusing, but it's not impossible. Let CDW and Dell help you with a solution to keep you protected. With 24-7, 365 Security Operations Center, they are well equipped to keep your organization safe. And with that, we'll leave you to our feature presentation. Hi, I'm John Platt, Distinguished Scientist at Google Research. And today I'd like to tell you about our efforts in AI for social good. Now, in order to do that, I'll first have to define what I mean by AI for social good, why it's a good idea to work on projects in that area, give you a couple of examples of projects that we've done, and then wrap up with some comments about why AI for social good is interesting to the whole AI field. So the world is facing some serious problems today. And in order to solve those problems, we're going to need to find scalable solutions so that organizations don't have to spend huge amounts of money to try to solve the problems throughout the world. Now, one way to get scaling is in the commercial context, where a company, uh, shown schematically in the left, provides help to people. Uh, those people then uh, pay the company back for the help, and it's a virtuous cycle because the company can then use that money to invest in more help for more people. Um, so this is a virtual cycle that allows commercial entities to scale to solve global problems. The trouble is, uh, there are free market failures, it, not all problems can be solved by commercial activities. Here's a few examples of market failures. Um, the classic problem of externalities, for example, in climate change, where people can put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for free and cause harm to other people. Another example of market failure is not everyone can afford to pay, uh, but uh, helping them benefits everyone. So for example, in public health, in infections, uh, you want everyone to be uh, helped, not just those who can afford to pay. And finally, another market failure is that ecosystems don't have property rights, right? You, the, the ecosystem can't afford to pay to protect themselves, but they're very valuable and provide services to everyone. So what do you do when um, market, commercial activity can't solve a global problem? One way to fight market failures is by AI for social good. A for social good helps extend the reach of non-commercial organizations to solve global problems through the use of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a way to make scalable sensing and decision making at low cost. If we help non-commercial organizations use artificial intelligence, they can solve global problems. But it can't just be pure artificial intelligence because AI lives in the world of software. Non-commercial organizations actually understand the problems they're trying to solve, and they have boots on the ground to actually implement the solution. So you need both. Now, there are a number of possible applications of AI for social good. Here are some subjects that AI for social good can work on. Uh, it can work on nature and society to help protect ecosystems. It can work on public or environmental health. Climate change is a, a very great target for AI for social good. Um, it can, AI for social good can be used for crisis response, which I'll talk about more today, and can be used for assistive technology for people with disabilities. Next, I'd like to tell you about some work we've done in crisis response, where we can scalably assess damage due to disasters so we can deploy humanitarian aid as quickly as we possibly can. So when you have crises like earthquakes, uh, aid workers who are trying to help people require very fast and accurate information. Uh, basic data like how many people were affected by the disaster, so you know how much aid to give them, where the aid is needed the most, and 
more specifically, uh, down to the neighborhood, what's the extent of the damage to the infrastructure? Now, you can do this from remote sensing. Um, satellites fly over uh, every spot in the globe relatively quickly, so you can get rapid imaging of the disaster-affected areas. The trouble is, if you want to find out where the damaged buildings are, uh, the current practice is that you have to manually annotate them. So you have to have uh, experts go through the satellite images and annotate each damaged building, and that could take weeks to complete, which is far too slow. So the goal of this particular project is to uh, make faster and more accurate coverage of post-disaster damage uh, using artificial intelligence applied to remote sensing so we can save lives and uh, maximize the efficiency of human humanitarian response. This project's a, a collaboration with the UN World Food Program and other UN agencies like UNISAT and REACH and with the uh, German Aerospace Lab DLR. So let's use machine learning to automate building damage assessment. We'll do this by first taking remote sensing or satellite image of a neighborhood. We'll then extract the buildings using standard techniques and then pull a patch of those image around the building and do histogram equalization for each patch. We'll then compare patches, one from before the disaster and one after, feed it to a neural network, which will then assess whether that building is damaged or not damaged. Uh, the neural network is trained with expert assessments on previous disasters. This is what the neural network architecture looks like. It's a convolutional neural network with a twin architecture. First, the pre-disaster and the post-disaster patch is fed to the neural network separately. Then the, the intermediate layers are subtracted. It's fed to more convolutional neural network blocks, a fully connected layer, and then it computes whether the building is uh, destroyed or not. Um, and so the output is a binary classification, damage, not damaged. Here are some examples of the output of the neural network uh, trained and tested on Haiti earthquake examples. You can see the patch uh, before and after the earthquake and the labels that the neural network provides. Uh, on the left, there are th three damaged patches. You can see that, sadly, the buildings are damaged and the model predicts high probability. Whereas on the right, the buildings are not damaged by the earthquake and, the, and here the earthquake, uh, sorry, here the neural network pr predicts that the uh, buildings are not damaged. So it's working well on earthquakes and we're extending it to other forms of disaster. Next, I'd like to tell you about another project in crisis response, which is predicting floods. This can save many human lives. So floods are a very serious problem worldwide. They affect more people than any other weather-related disasters on the globe. Every year, 250 million people are affected by a flood, and floods cause $10 billion of damage. So we've decided to make a flood forecasting initiative here at Google. And the goal is to make act and actionable flood alerts that cover everyone that is affected by floods all over the globe. In the beginning, we're just focusing on riverine floods, flooded rivers, as opposed to flash floods or coastal flooding. So how do we do flood forecasting? Well, it has three steps. First, we make a hydrologic model. A hydrologic model takes all the environmental factors and predicts how much discharge a river is going to have. Discharge is the amount of water in the river, number of cubic meters per second. Given the discharge, we then feed it to a hydraulic model. A hydraulic model uh, understands where the flood is going to happen given a certain level of discharge. In other words, how high and where the river is going to be. Once we realize where flooding is going to happen from the hydraulic model, we hook it up to a pre-existing warning distribution system that Google has and alert people that they're going to be in a flood zone. So machine learning actually can help for both the hydrologic and the hydraulic model. Let me zoom in on the hydrologic model and explain how we use machine learning there. The hydrologic model takes uh, inputs that you might expect, like precipitation or rainfall, but it also models things like evaporation from the rivers, the amount of snow that's melting, and how much water goes from the surface down into the ground. 
The classical approach to doing hydrologic modeling is to build a physics-based model, as shown here in the right. And that's conceptually simple because every part of physics has a part in your model. Trouble is, each of these boxes has parameters inside of it, and that can lead to an overfit model. And in fact, you need to fit those parameters once for every location. So it's very difficult to calibrate this whole model and takes a lot of effort. Instead, we're taking a machine learning based approach to hydrologic model with no explicit modeling. It's just an LSTM that takes the time series of parameters from in the environment, things like precipitation or snow melt, and produces a time series of discharge. Now we can extend that to a spatiotemporal modeling using an architecture called hydronets. Here at every location, there's an LSTM. And then as the rivers combine together, their states in the LSTM are combined together to produce a, a new LSTM at a new spatial location. That new spatial location predicts the water level and then sends the hidden states downstream to combine and make yet another LSTM further downstream. So the whole network looks very much like um, uh, the river system that it's modeling. It also supports transfer learning. A lot of these little subnetworks are shared between the locations. The ML-based hydrologic model works pretty well. Here are some results. On the x-axis is the quality of the model. Zero is the same as guessing the average discharge at all times, whereas one means perfectly estimating the discharge at all times. Uh, the y-axis is the cumulative density function, so how likely it is you'll, you'll reach the value at the x-axis. These dashed lines show various classical models uh, calibrated in different ways. And of course, the lower you are to the lower right, the better you are. And so here are the machine learning models, which are notably better. They are much more likely to have a higher quality model. So we've actually deployed these hydrologic models in our flood prediction. So when we actually try to alert people, we do. It's that this is actually working in India. Uh, we use our public alerting system that's already part of search and maps and just Android smartphone notifications. Now that system exists beyond floods. It's already sent alerts to over 2 billion people for hundreds of thousands of events. You may have gotten one already. Uh, we add flood notifications through this system and that helps the, uh, uh, the governmental authorities and the local authorities communicate emergency messages. And so we can reach out to millions of people to warn them about their floods. We're also doing community-based learning because not everyone has a smartphone. So we distribute our information, our flooding information to local NGOs, which will then um, run around and in person on motorcycles or other techniques, uh, notified local towns folks. Um, this is funded, funded by Google.org. Finally, I'd like to wrap up by putting AI for social good into a broader social context. AI for social good isn't a exercise in pure software, but it actually gets released and affects people's lives. So we have a responsible innovation process to make sure that when we release AI for social good projects, they cause good and not harm. And we do that by checking against our AI principles, uh, which are seven points that are listed here, before we release the software to make sure that uh, any projects we release are socially beneficial and have a lot of good properties like uh, uh, avoiding bias, uh, uh, that they're safe, uh, that they're private. You can see, you can read them all here. So um, uh, before we release, we, we have a filter to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And then after the release, it's interesting to understand the impact of AI for social good on uh, society and culture in general. Now, it turns out that there's an existing field of study of how technologies interact with society. It's called science and technology studies. And artificial intelligence is an increasingly important topic in this field of study. And a number of people have already done some work in it. I've listed some of them here, Denton, Crawford, Gebu, Weil, and Mitchell. Um, and for AI for social good projects, uh, you can ask for any specific project did it work as we expected? And if not, why not? Because then we can uh, get that feedback and, and do better next time. And then there's this longer term question of how does deploying social good uh, AI or social impact AI affect science and culture? So this is a call to say, let's treat AI for social good as a scientific endeavor, not just as simply engineering where we throw projects out, but actually 
carefully track what happens when we deploy social impact AI so we can learn more about the interaction between AI and society. So that's the end of my talk. AI for social good can be used to help non-commercial entities scale to solve global problems. I've given you a couple of examples of AI for social good projects that I think are doing a lot of good in the world. And I believe we should apply the scientific method to AI for social good projects to see how they influence society and vice versa. Thank you. This talk is part of a series that aims to collect money for Centrade, a nonprofit dedicated to fight poverty and social exclusion. Please click on the link in the description section of this video to donate to support them in their efforts.